All right. Um, uh, our next uh, paper gets us more into the 3D content space. Uh, uh, this is a um, uh, joint work um, of uh, Stefan Kopf and uh, uh, also Martin Effelsberg from uh, University of Mannheim. Uh, we will um, uh, talk about uh, silency detection for uh, stereoscopic uh, video. And Stefan is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, University of Mannheim. A way we could perhaps also merge uh, questions, our research questions, because what we do is we look at videos and try to identify what's most important, most salient, and then perhaps use it for compression. And in the previous talk we had it that uh, we have some computer games and try to identify some textures, but also have to think about what is the most important texture, perhaps the object that is closest to the camera, and then use better compression, find some priorities how to do it. Now this talk is about Silency detection for stereoscopic video. I just read uh, last year, uh, last week, a few numbers I would like <coughs> to present to you. So why we uh, stereoscopic videos are so important and perhaps are possibly will be more important in the next few years. So there's some estimates that about 70% of the cinemas in Europe support um, that digital or uh, use digital projectors. Worldwide, it's even a bit, bit higher the number. And just here in Norway, I read that it's nearly 100%. So we need it. If we only look at now these uh, movie theaters, then an estimate between 50 and 60% also have the possibility to play back 3D content, 3D movies. Uh, number for the tickets sold uh, for our 3D movies in Germany, it's about 22%, but it's continuously increasing. So also the content will increase over time. Now the question for saliency detection. Why do we need saliency detection? What are the advantages if we get some information from videos or images or stereoscopic videos? First uh, possibility is to use it for compression. So uh, if we just use something like a wavelet-based compression, for example, um, and use higher compression rates, everything gets blurry, so the quality is no longer accepted, acceptable. But um, if we only compress about 50% of the pixels with the same blurring, so uh, it, this is the example now, we cannot see as humans that there is the compression included. So this is a clear advantage. If we identify what is salient in an image or a video, we could use it for compression. There are other areas of research that benefit from saliency detection. For example, if you look at digital watermarks, the watermark should be robust, so it should be extractable even if you modify the content but at the same time it should be invisible for human observers. So we also need saliency. Or if you look at image retargeting, uh, if you uh, think of the main talk yesterday, um, it's also a main question how to adapt um, existing content to different display resolutions, especially if you consider aspect ratio changes. So scaling or cropping doesn't work very well. So you need to know what is salient in an image. Okay. Um, after this brief motivation, I would like to give you an overview of the system. Um, we have three different saliency detectors we are using. First one is about image saliency, so we look at local contrast in images. Second one is about moving objects, and the third one about the depth information in the videos. Then we uh, present some, or I will present some results about how to merge these uh, saliency maps, and then give you some information about uh, our evaluation. Okay, as the input we have um, a stereoscopic video, we have to do some image preparation to split it into two views and then send the views to the three different saliency operators. Um, the left view is only processed for image saliency and motion saliency and only both views are sent for a depth saliency. Then we have to combine the views and later use it in some application. So there are the different possibilities how to use this information in later steps, in a later system. Okay, now what's the main idea of image salience here? So we make the assumption that a salient object significantly differs from all the other objects in the local neighborhood. And we have to or try to identify uh, these important objects. There are two different general approaches that can be used. First one is a uh, top-down approach, so try to identify the most important object, like face recognition. 
and then look perhaps uh, the location of the person, or to use bottom-up approaches, look at the pixel volumes, analyze them, merge important regions or pixel areas, and then get uh, this cell dense region. We are using this uh, bottom-up approach. Um, the idea is inspired by work from Cheng um, that was presented two years ago. Um, the idea is the following. We have um, uh, an image here, for example, the flower in the upper part. Um, the first step is to reduce the overall number of colors. Uh, this is step is only used to um, yeah, get much better processing times. So, um, uh, and later we compare the color differences of this uh, quantized image and get a silency map. So this is presented here in the lower parts where we always we have uh, high values uh, or bright values indicate a high silency value for the, the, yeah, for the specific algorithm. So uh, how does quantization work? Um, the goal was to improve the runtime. What we do is we look at RGB color space, only take or reduce each color channel to 12 different values, and in addition, replace colors that occur too infrequently with all, all other uh, already available colors. In this example, we have an image with about 40K colors, reduce it to 200 different colors, and here in the lower part, you see the histogram of these 200 different colors, and the following step of the algorithm only considers this histogram, and this is the main advantage that we only have to, so uh, the complexity is now or the total number that we have to consider is in this example about 200 different values that we have to process. Now we have to find um, a measurement to describe image saliency. In this case, we use LAB color space. The advantage of this color space is if you take two values from this color space, uh, have a certain distance, it does not matter which colors you choose, it's always similar the effect on the human visual system, so the difference, so it's always similar. And that's not true for RGB color space, for example. And what we do is we um, just take the frequencies of a certain color from the histogram, FJ, um, compute the absolute color difference of the current color to all the other colors, summarize them up, and get a saliency value for this color. So we do it for all these 200 colors in our example, and then map the colors back to the image and get a saliency image. Now, if we think of motion saliency, um, motion is a very fundamental skill, and we can easily detect, detect motion. So in static images, it's hard to detect the, the important objects. But if you look at, uh, for example, a mu uh, small video, um, you will clearly recognize, ah, there's perhaps a mouse moving or so, even if the camera is shaking, we can recognize uh, there is something interesting in it. So there are some general approaches like optical flow, motion vectors, or motion history maps. We selected the third approach. I would like, briefly like to introduce the idea. So the idea is to look at the differences between consecutive frames, so to get or compute a moving average of the frames. Um, therefore, we use a factor alpha that weights the current frame and one minus alpha all these accumulated history uh, uh, frames. And then we compute the difference between these accumulated frames and the current frame. In addition, because these uh, um, yeah, maps are usually very blurry or very noisy, uh, we uh, use or uh, we smooth out a bit um, uh, these uh, images. Therefore, we apply uh, erosion and dilation steps. So what we do is we first uh, compute the absolute differ difference here between image and the accumulated image, apply, um, in this case, first erosion, then dilation step, and uh, this smooths out the over, or yeah, gives, a better, gives some better results and reduces the noise. Okay, the third saliency map that we consider um, makes the following assumption. So it's about depth. And the assumption is that the objects that are close to the camera are more relevant compared to the other objects in the background. Um, this is the general assumption. Um, later in the experiments, we will see this is not always true. So more steps have to be done. Um, so therefore, our approach is to identify so-called pop-out regions. So and we can do it by analyzing the disparity, so the horizontal shift of the pixels. 
We are using approach presented by Hirschmuller about five years ago to do it. We selected this approach because it's very fast. Um, now, the idea of this approach is to define some costs. F the main cost fun uh, factor, C1, um, defines the luminance differences <coughs> for one pixel if you are looking to another pixel in the second view and just computing the absolute differences. This will get very noisy results, so therefore we need some additional costs like C2, C3 to smooth out these uh, disparity maps. And then we have to somehow find the optimum uh, values for the disparity values for all the pixels. Oh, sorry. Um, this is the general problem is NP complete, so we have to somehow simplify it and do use some optimizations. Um, so we are use it from this 2D problem to a 1D problem by analyzing a path that moves to the current pixel um, that describes then the disparity. And we do not uh, compute uh, the disparity for all individual pixels, but for small blocks. That also improves the performance. Um, in addition, we just check the resolution of the video, input video, and based on this information, we estimate the maximum valid disparity that is uh, used in such a video. Okay, then the last step is to smooth, um, or to, to merge the three different saliency maps, image saliency, motion, and depth saliency. Um, we use whites, uh, these whites are summed up to one. Um, in our case, we, rec we early recognized that the motion is always relevant. Therefore, we used a fixed weight for the motion factor. There was no example where we could say, uh, ignore the ocean or um, use only motion, for example. So the combination worked best. Therefore, we just fixed this volume. But the other two weights um, uh, should not be, uh, uh, constant weights should not be used for the other two parameters, for the other two weights. This does not work very well. So for the other two ones, we have to look at the content of the scene to choose suitable weights. Um, we already, uh, from the saliency operators, we know some information about a frame. For example, the maximum distance of colors in a frame. This is called here C, the maximum distance. And we, if we have great color differences in a scene, then, um, the salient objects are typically detected very well. If you think of a scene with only blue sky and perhaps uh, some sea or so, everything is blue, it's very difficult to identify salient regions in the scene. But if there's a big color difference, it's much more easier. So the probability that we get good saliency results for image saliency is higher if we have a great color difference. So therefore, we define some thresholds if we have a very high color difference and we have a second threshold for um, the percentage of pixels uh, in pop-out regions. If this percentage is low, then we should emphasize the importance of the um, image saliency. So we use higher, uh, larger weights. And the opposite is also true. So if um, there is no relevant uh, color contrast in the frame, but a very strong depth information included, then we will use, mostly use this depth information. And yeah, in all the other cases, if both values are high or both values are low, we will use some fixed weights. We slightly use higher values for image saliency because it's a bit more robust, this estimator. Okay, let's present some results. Um, we, um, well, the first step was to um, mark all regions uh, that are not salient. So therefore, we m used this merged saliency maps, created a binary map, and then identified the outer shapes for all these regions. We sl slightly had to increase these regions because usually the saliency pixels are located just at the borders of all the salience objects. Um, and especially in case of motion saliency, there is some, maybe some time gap until the correct region is detected, so due to this motion history. Um, so we slightly increased this region. Um, and the next step we had to do was also to detect uh, the corresponding region in the second view. 
So now we have labeled all the pixels that are non-salient. And what we did for our user evalu evaluation was to blur, heavily blur, these non-salient pixels. So we use a Gaussian blurring. We use an adaptive window size. So it, again, depends on the number of different colors and on the contrast of the image whether the blurring is noticeable or not. So we want to make it clear that everyone who watches this area uh, immediately recognize these errors. Um, so in case of, for example, low contrast images, we use a large blurring window so that the overall impression of this blurring is very high. Let's look at an example here. Um, in the center, we, we see a part of a video sequence, the original frame. Um, we used different combinations for the saliency detectors and the blurring. So for example, here in the upper part, the background is blurred and part of the head or the hair is blurred. Um, in the left image, there's an example. So here, part of the, um, here, again, background is blurred and perhaps hand and arm is also blurred. Um, Um, it's actually it's a bit larger. So in this case, um, I would consider the person and the uh, uh, so the I, I can go to the or if you only look at this image, I would say it's the person and uh, yeah the full part of the person. Only parts of the background are non salient in this case. I would say so it's about um, seventy percent of the image region that is salient. So we cannot blur most parts of it. And if, for example, the part of here, the hair is blurred, we will recognize it. So it's not a good selection. Or in this case, we will recognize that there are some errors. So this should not be done. Yeah, but isn't the real salient part of this image the bug that's being passed from one, because that's the action of the whole image? Yeah, that's so the most that's important. Yeah, so the but isn't that also yeah. the problem in detecting what the real salience is? It's not a color issue, and it's not a motion issue. It's a semantic issue. Yes, it's always a semantic issue, but the idea is to use some tricks to perhaps estimate it, or to, in this case, to estimate non-salient regions. And I think this non-salient detection, this is something that works quite well. So it's not guaranteed that we always get the salient part. This, I think, it's, we have to under really understand. Perhaps in this case, it could only be, yes, only this handling over of this cup or so. The, that's most important. Um, but um, I think to estimate what is not so relevant might be possible and could also be used for, for example, this compression or watermarking or so. It's not perfect, so it's not um, closing the semantic gap. That's not possible So with this approach. I think in your threshold, that's actually where the semantics yeah. match yeah. into, right? What's motion or what's not motion? Yeah, yeah. Or what's size. But later we will see that it strongly depends on individual persons. So this is... Um, uh, Finding a general threshold that is valid for everyone is, I think, not uh, from our experience, perhaps not possible. We had a small experiment only yet, so with 12 test users. Um, they are using these uh, shutter glass technologies and watched four differently blurred versions of the videos. We had four videos. They could watch them again and again, so they are between 10 seconds and 60 seconds each video. So they had sufficient time so to spend half an hour until one hour each user to look at the videos and to give some feedback about the videos and also go back again to the previous video and to compare it. So they had some time to do it. Um, even the original videos had some encoding errors included. So the people noticed some errors. So we had a scale from one to five, worst to best. And uh, no video got the best marks from every user. So the, everyone recognized some encoding errors or some parts that are not totally correct or did not appear correct. Now, if we look at um, image and motion, uh, if we combi only combine these two saliency maps, um, again, we use uh, this fixed factor for motion of 0 0.3. Then we get some average, let's say, average results. Here, in this case of the first video here, um, we had the problem that the color of the hat and hair is very similar to the background color. And this was typically not selected as salient. And therefore, it was heavily blurred and are in some parts, and we got only saw this average world here. So. Um, if we only combine depth and motion, we get uh, in two videos, we had very bad results. Um, so the for example, in the center uh, image, you see that the person is behind these flowers, 
So it's in this case not marked as salient a region. So and so the general assumption that the person next to the curve or the object next to the camera is the most important <laughs> may not always be true. So we have to think a bit more about it in the future, I think. Um, here in the Ice Age example, this is the version where we have, which we have already blurred. You will see that only the nose and uh, one eye is clearly visible, and all the other parts are heavily blurred. So, of course, the, um, this animal, um, yeah, or the depth effect of this animal is very strong, and therefore only parts of the animals are selected. So, another thing we have to consider is to inc fully include all objects, not to include only part as salient region. That's another open issue. Now, if we <laughs> use dynamic whites, in some cases we are a bit better compared only to using motion. Um, we have the negative effect of this depth that uh, for these two videos that we uh, have to consider. Um, it's not so strong, this effect, but we only get average results. Total average, we are slightly better. Um, but I think there's a lot of work we have to do yet. Even, I think, more important is the individual user feedback we got. Um, all uh, of the feedback strongly depends on the stereo video experience a user has. So if we had some students who regularly watched uh, 3D movies in cinemas, and these people immediately recognized errors in the background. They just told us, ah, okay, no, that's not acceptable. People who have only seen a few uh, who are not so experienced with 3D content, they did not recognize any errors in the background. So they only focus on these uh, objects that pop out. So um, there's a very strong correlation about the experience of an individual user and the regions the user is focusing on. Another um, issue is uh, the content itself. So if we have a very static scene or limited motion, few cuts, in the scene, then we uh, recognize errors very fast. If there's a lot of motion, we cannot see it. So we could use much more blurring, and the scene was still okay if there's a, a fast action scene, for example. Um, in animated movies, like this Ice Age movie, um, we accept errors, uh, or much higher errors. So um, perhaps it's um, this artificial scene that, uh, or that we are not so familiar or that we do not know in reality how it should look like. So therefore, um, the genre has a strong effect on the uh, feedback. And if a user already knows a video, so there are some users who have seen the Ice Age movie, they look to different parts. So if they have seen such a movie, they immediately recognize there are some distortions in such a movie. Um, so, uh, just looking at the individual saliency detectors, uh, image saliency is in our was in our case the most reliable detector. Um, there are only a few errors, especially if all some of the colors are similar. Um, and if or if a really salient object like the person uh, in the left view um, has a very similar color to the background, then we have some problems. In case of motion saliency, we always, oh, not always, but usually also get good results. They are usually reliable. Mm, for example, here in, in this case, um, the flower is static, so we do not get any motion information about it. Um, so, um, and perhaps also the lamp on the right example is not part of this, um, but usually uh, the person or people or objects that move are captured. Depth sensory is um, also the most critical part. Um, the disparity maps that we get are not very robust. So uh, there are, there's a lot of noise in these disparity maps. Um, and uh, yeah, perhaps if you, uh, we need some better techniques, better algorithms. We tried out some other disparity map algorithms, uh, perhaps the one from the talk yesterday where we use some dense feature matching and then put on the grid could help to improve the overall problem to avoid this noise. Um, but mm, I'm not sure if it's possible to get really good uh, disparity maps. Okay, one uh, brief 
information about the computation time. It's pretty fast for low resolution images, so it's about 60 milliseconds for image saliency, 20 for motion, and 150 for depth saliency. Um, if we use more complex um, uh, estimations for this depth saliency, like a graph cuts approach, this takes perhaps 50 times or 100 times as long. So. But we can use it for videos. It's not real time, but if we do some optimization, I think that should not be a problem to also process videos in real time. Okay, um, we computed or used three different saliency descriptors to analyze stereoscopic video, image, motion, and depth saliency. Um, the depth or the disparity maps are very noisy in, or in all of the videos we analyzed. Um, most, uh, one of the most important factors for the evaluation and the feedback that we got is the, sp uh, the specific characteristic of a person. So, for example, um, what is the stereo video experience of a certain person? Um, in addition, we uh, have to consider the content of the scene. So, what is the genre? What, is, um, what are the changes or the difference in the scene? And, uh, yeah. Back, uh, going back to the person, what is the previous knowledge of the certain video? What we have to do is to do much more experience in this area. So because without this experience, we do not get uh, suitable feedback, how the human visual system really works. Um, what we have learned is that uh, objects are most relevant. So if we only partially burn an object, this is not acceptable anymore. So we have to somehow try to get it, but it's quite a difficult problem. And the long-term goal, something that perhaps may be achieved in 20 years or so, would be some kind of psychoanalysis model of 3D perception that we really understand how our perception system works. Okay, thank you. Hi, very nice. Um, so there are two kinds of videos. One that have an explicit narrative model, that is to say they're made based on a script and a director's vision and, and others, and there are those without a, a specific model or where there's an implicit narrative model. It would seem that the narrative model in a lot of the cases of content that you have could be, could be used as a steering parameter to do a lot of the work for you because you're spending an awful lot of time trying to figure out what's important in a scene where the person who's made that scene has already figured yeah. out what's important yeah. in it. Um, for home videos that's different because they tend to be much more incidental in nature. Have you looked at those two classes and have you looked at, at integrating um, explicit narrative information as a steering parameter yeah. into this yeah. work? This um, We uh, started with the perspective that we only get a video, for example, on YouTube. There are a lot of stereoscopic videos available on YouTube. And we want to then process it. It would be much better and we would have much more information if, for example, if we create an animation movie to, uh, we know all objects, we know the position of the objects, we know the depth information for all objects. If we render it, and then we could also use some specific compression algorithms for these specific content. But uh, our perspective was not to go from the producer side, but from uh, the client side or end user side. The video is available. We um, do not have any additional information about the production process. Um, if we could use, um, I think all stereoscopic production has to consider the depth information to how to adjust the depth. Um, if we have or could use this information, we would get much better results. But our assumption was, okay, content is available, and now we want to do some semantic analysis of the content. And one of the first, so a post-processing step, something like this. Okay. So, okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, I have the understanding that for proper uh, stereoscopic perception, we need basically the <coughs> images to be sharp everywhere in order to be able to perceive mm -hmm. negative, both negative and positive, mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, disparities. Uh, 
question is the following. If, uh, did you remark any, um, if you had, if you determined the non-salient regions to be, for example, in the background mm -hmm. with negative disparity or in the, uh, or in the deep background also with positive disparity, does that have an, an effect when you blur it? Could you still, mm -hmm. um, uh, could we still uh, really s uh, perceive it correctly as, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. As, um, mm -hmm. We, uh, for uh, the objects that are in the foreground, we did not blur them. So uh, I can only say a bit about if the background is blurred. Um, in our examples, we did not see a negative effect for the depth impression. Um, I also read some information about that you c uh, or the human brain can replace some information very well. So you can, for example, also blur some parts in only one of both views were heavily blurred and you can still reconstruct it and do not see it. If you specifically look for it, then you will recognize it. But it takes some time to see that there's something wrong in one of the, on one of both views. So the human brain merged it very well, um, this blurring. If it's, it, this blurring focuses on a person that's in the front or a salient object, then you will clearly recognize it. But generally, that we did not see bad effects on the depth. So it was okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In average, we pr uh, blurred for all these videos between 40 and 45 percent of the pixels. So there's still a large amount of pixels that is not blurred, and perhaps this is enough for um, to get the good depth impression. So this is perhaps. Okay. Well, let's uh, take other questions offline. I'm okay. sure there will be a lot of interesting discussion.